بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and give you jannah for those ya Rabb, ameen, ameen, ameen. Welcome to our Quran journey. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a fruitful discussion, ya Rabb, ameen. We begin inshallah with the recitation of Surah Al-Mutafifi and then we'll go into the analysis in the light ta'ala and the discussion. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويل للمطففين الذين إذا اكتالوا على الناس يستوفون وَإِذَا كَانُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ كلا إن كتاب الفجار لفي سجين وما أدراك ما سجين كتاب مرقوم ويل يومئذ للمكذبين الذين يكذبون بيوم وما يكذب به إلا كل معتد أثيم إذا تتلى عليه آياتنا قال أساطير الأولين كلا بل ران على قلوبهم ما كانوا يكسبون كلا إنهم عن ربهم يومئذ لمحجوبون ثم إنهم لصال الجحيم ثم يقال هذا الذي كنتم به تكذبون كلا إن كتاب الأبر في علين وما أدراك ما عليون كتاب مرقوم يشهده المقربون إن الأبرار لفي نعيم على الأراضي تعرف في وجوههم نظرة النعيم يسقون من رحيق مختوم ختامه مسك وفي ذلك فليتنافس المتنافسون ومزاجه من تسنيم عينا يشرب بها المقربون إن الذين أجرموا كانوا من الذين آمنوا يضحكون وإذا مروا بهم يتغامزون وإذا انقلبوا إلى أهلهم قلبوا فكهين وإذا رأوهم قالوا إن هؤلاء لضالون وما أرسلوا عليهم حافظين 
فاليوم الذين آمنوا من الكفار يضحكون على الأرائك ينظرون هل ثوب الكفار ما كانوا يفعلون بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you and to give us all Jannah for those here of Ameen. May Allah give us the ability to understand the Quran, to reflect on the Quran, to memorize the Quran and to share the Quran in the most beautiful of ways, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Inshallah, we're continuing with the discussion of Surah Al-Mutatafeen. And Surah Al-Mutatafeen is a very beautiful Surah, just like most of the Surah, all the Surah in the Quran, MashaAllah. Are beautiful but this one is exceptionally beautiful especially for me like I, I, when you hear the ayat of the quran in the surah the, the the rhyme the the meaning the images it's a very powerful surah and so to continue from what we discussed last time last time we discussed how uh, this surah was revealed in the transitioning period between mecca and medina that a portion of it was revealed in mecca at the end of mecca and a portion of it was revealed in medina at the beginning of medina and it captures a very common trend and a common issue that was happening in the market, both in Mecca, which was a city center and very uh, known for commercial and for trade and for business, and also in Medina. And there's a hadith actually attributed to Rasulullah in which the companions, Ibn Abbas and others, describe that Medina used to be uh, very, very plagued with bad business practices, bad business practices. Until this surah was revealed, to them, and when the surah was revealed to them, they became the best of businessmen and the best of businesswomen. And then Nabi Sallallahu actually made dua for the people of Medina. He says, "Oh Allah, put barakah in their saw, in their mud." And these are the things that they used to use to measure. These were units of measurements. Um, the saw was used for wudu, so the amount of water needed for wudu, and the mud was used uh, used for ghusl, the amount of water that was needed for ghusl. Uh, but besides that, they used, used to uh, use these scales for buying and selling rice, flour, and other things as well. So Nabi Sallam made dua for their uh, you know, units of measurements to be blessed. And uh, the companions commented that after this the revelation of the surah and the dua of Nabi Sallam, the people of Medina till this day continue to be some of the most ethical of business people. Most ethical of business people. If we're to go back to the surah, because we have to contextualize the, the surah to the other ayat and to the other surah in the um, juz amma. Now, uh, I know this, the slides are not up on the uh, screen. I'm not sure what's happening. I think there's a bit of a tech issue, but hopefully, inshallah, the brothers can resolve it and the sisters. Um, but in the meantime, you know, the notes are accessible on the WhatsApp group, so you can access the notes, inshallah, on your phone or on your devices. So, if you go back to the surah that we discussed before, Surah Amma captured a big discussion, a debate that was happening on the nature of resurrection. Is, is the resurrection real? Is it an act of the body? Is it an act of the soul? Is it just something that is imagined to scare people? Or is it really, really something that we're going to go through physically? Is it metaphorical or is it physical? And then the conversations back and forth. And Nazi'at captures the angels as they're swiftly taking the souls of the believers in a beautiful trans, uh, in a beautiful uh, and, 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 and respectful manner. And then those who are, whose souls are being grasped with aggression and violence because they've become too comfortable with the dunya. And then we go into Surah um, uh, uh, Abasa in which we see an image of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu having to having to negotiate or having to balance between his commitment to those who are already Muslim and wanting to learn and also wanting to secure the interests of the Muslim community by giving da'wah to others who are outside the community that could really be important key uh, you know, stakeholders and also important decision makers. And the surah is very beautiful. And we go into surah al-taqweer and al-infitar and they capture the beautiful images that lead up and the horrific also images that lead up to the day of resurrection. And then they capture also events that happen on the day of resurrection. And then Surah al mutaffafin is sandwiched between three surahs, Surah al taqweer Surah al infitar and Surah Al-Ghashiyah. And we talked about the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu in which he says, whoever wants to see the day of resurrection as if it's happening right in front of them, let them read these three surahs. And in between these three surahs, this surah is sandwiched, Surah al mutaffafin which begins with a glimpse into the ethics of the believers, especially in the marketplace, 
but the marketplace captures an ethic that should exist also outside the market in every aspect of our life. So let's begin with the surah and break down the words. For those who have attended, this was a brief summary, of course. For those who didn't attend, it might sound a little bit difficult to understand what's going on. Just read, uh, look at the notes and go back to uh, the discussion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with wailun lil mutaffifin. And we talked about wail in this dunya is a curse that is invoked. And in the akhirah, it refers to a valley that is very, very horrific in its description. If you look at At-Tabari, and if you look at Muqatil, they mention... Okay, no problem. They mention that Wayl is a valley in hell that takes 70 years to cross and has 70,000 subdivisions and 70 sub 70,000 subsections, and it's full of this and full of that. So very gruesome, very gruesome descriptions that talk about this valley and the horrific nature of the punishment in this area. So that's in the Akhirah. But Wayl is used in the colloquial and in the language of the Arabs to refer to a tragedy of some kind. When you're affected by something very harsh, you say Wayl, Ya Waylata, Ya Wayla, right? You say, oh no. And that's why some of the translations will say, woe to the mutaffifin. So what does the mutaffifin as a word mean? Mutaffifin comes from the root ta fa fa. And ta fa fa is associated with basically measurement, edge, border, margin, limit, also to fan, to, to be full, to overflow, to be completely um, over, over abundant, uh, tafif, little in quantity, incomplete. And when you put the words together, mutaffif literally means the one who gives short measure and short weight. Antufaf is the quantity that falls short of filling a vessel or the vessel itself when it's a little bit less than what it should be or a little bit in quantity that remains left in the vessel. Okay, so what does this all mean? To make it simple and accessible. The word mutafif is used to describe two, two things that are almost in opposite when you think about them and imagine them. The first is a little bit, a little bit of something that is left at the bottom or the overflowing that happens and by overflowing the cup can't hold the quantity so it basically tips over you know when you have uh, when you pour some coke into a container and you pour it very quickly the fizziness of the drink actually forces the drink to overflow so that action of, of something that is something that is left behind or something that overflows that is referred to as the or captured by the root of the word Fa, fa, fa. Perfect. So let me just do this here so you can see it. Oh no, where did it go? I think it is. Can everybody see the notes now? Perfect. So it refers to people who have double standards in the measurement. So when they give, when it's time, imagine as a business person, when they're giving, they basically try to cut corners to give a little bit less than what is deserved. So they try to cut, you know, like a 2%, 3% to basically save and to make money. And when they receive, when they're buying, they will change the units of measurement. So they have two different units of measurements, one for selling and one for buy, so that they're able to basically save more in both transactions. One buying to get more for less and one giving to give less for more. So that's basically the problem of the mutaffif. The mutaffif is someone who's cutting corners, not for big margins, yeah, for very little margins. But over time, they've convinced themselves that you know, if I continue to do this over and over and over again, I will actually make quite a bit of money over the month, right? 1% here and there, here and there, here and there adds up. So this is basically how they hope to accumulate wealth. And there's a bit of deception here and a bit of basically taking advantage of the person that you're basically dealing with. And as a, as a rule, this doesn't only, as we said last time, it doesn't only limit itself to the marketplace. It applies to every aspect of our life. The mutaffif could be someone who's being cold to his wife while expecting her to be warm with him. Could be someone who's harsh to their children but expects them to be respectful towards them. Could be someone who has disregard to their friends, doesn't pick up their phone calls, 
but expects them to be there for him or her. Being cheap as a boss, so you have your, you know, your employees, you don't treat them with respect, you don't encourage them, you don't motivate them, you don't give them the financial incentive. And then on the opposite side, you expect them to be fully present with their heart. And then you blame them. What's wrong with these people? Why can't they give their full heart into this? Why don't they care about the project, right? Or it could be someone basically who rushes their prayer and expects the prayer to basically protect them. Oh, I hear about the ayat in the Quran of how the prayer is supposed to protect me from lust, how the prayer is supposed to increase me in self-control and resilience, how the prayer is supposed to cultivate patience and cultivate love, but it's not working. Why is it not working? Well, have you really given the prayer the right that it deserves? Have you given it the attention in form and in meaning and in spirit for it to actually work? It could be someone as a teacher who expects their students to succeed and expects the students to give 100%, but they themselves are not given 100% in their teaching. They're not present, they're being lazy. They don't prepare sufficient notes. They don't go out of their way to actually ensure that every student has understood. And then they expect at the end of the year for the student to actually have walked away with sufficient understanding. So this duality in the standards, this duality in what is expected versus what is given is captured here by the word وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ The mutaffifin get this severe punishment in the akhir and get this curse invoked upon them in the dunya. Now this is very powerful because a lot of people have this understanding that religion is supposed to just regulate what? It's supposed to regulate your actions between you and God. It's a, pra it's a practice that is very private. It's a practice that is between you and your Lord. It refers to a bunch of rituals that you do and some form of akhlaq and ethics that are here and there but it shouldn't actually enter what? It shouldn't enter the marketplace. It shouldn't affect the business and the trade. And this is a very secular way of looking at the world. But Islam from the very beginning, imagine as the Prophet Muhammad Sallam is transitioning from Mecca to Medina, what's gonna happen? The Muslims are going to go from a group, being a group to being a community. A community with their own autonomy, a community with their own values, a community with their own a uh, structure and a community with their own, you can say, governance. So they have their governance. And the Quran is now going to do what? It's going to articulate the basics for that society to succeed. So the first thing that it addresses, imagine, or one of the earliest things it addresses is what? The marketplace, the economy. Why? Because subhanAllah, the economy in many, many ways is the center of the society. In many ways, it becomes the center of the society. And that's why a lot of different philosophies that, con that basically are at each other come back to economic worldviews. Think about capitalism versus communism, right? We live in a capitalistic society. What drives the society in many ways is what? Is the money, the marketplace, the free market, the laissez-faire, let things be. And then on the other side, communism, the root of it is to do what? Is to basically share wealth, common wealth and share, like shared wealth. So you have at the, at, the, at, the, at the corner or the center of how you define a society, the value, the money and the way that money should be earned and the way that money should be shared and the way the exchanges should take place and transactions should take place in the market. And this actually bothers many people. Like what, why is your religion so focused on these transactions and so focused on you know moving beyond the private sphere why does it intrude on the public sphere well actually there's no intrusion there's no that, that dichotomy between the private public and private sphere is a new concept in islam there was no public versus private sphere distinction in islam islamic practice there may have been a distinction public versus private in terms of like what you wear and some ethics and for example the private, you can, you don't have to wear your hijab as a sister. The public area, when you're wearing the hijab, you can now become fully active in the public. So there was that distinction in the sense of practice and wear and clothing and etiquettes, how you sit and things like that. But it wasn't a separation in terms of where religion is. Religion is in the house, outside, we're going to basically be neutral. Actually, you know, from the very beginning, Islam focuses on these things. And when you read Medina and Quran, you'll see it actually applies to every aspect, how the Muslims are going to trade, how they're going to structure the society, how they're going to structure their governance, how they're going to structure their, um, their warfare, how they're going to structure the defense, how they're going to structure the, um, you know, many aspects of basically what we call the modern state. Now, here's the problem, my brothers and my sisters. The minute we reduce Islam to a, 
a form of ethics, Islam becomes redundant to real world problems. Or Islam becomes irrelevant to real world problems. What does this mean? The minute we start imagining shiuch and scholars and teachers to just be experts in deen and rituals, we have a problem. We have a problem. And the modern, the modern institutionalization, the, 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 the bureaucratization of the sharia, right? When the nation state was being formed and as it continues to move in terms of defining its borders and also its agents, the sharia becomes reduced to what? To the family court and to the personal status court. So those are the, like in, in Muslim countries, Muslim countries, usually when you have an issue that is economic, an issue that is political, an issue with the like job security, you go to the legal court, which yes, claims to root itself in the sharia, but actually implements and practices, you know, secular law in many ways. Where the sharia becomes relevant is in family court, divorce, marriage, things like that, ritual. You go to the sheikh when you want to know how to pray janazah. You go to the sheikh when you want to know how to pray your five daily prayers, how to make wudu, how to do ghusl, how to wash the body. So the, 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 the sheikh's role or the Muslim juristic's role or the faqih's role slowly being redefined to basically focus on just the ritual. And the minute this happens, what, what's the problem there? The problem is Islam becomes redundant. Islam, Islam doesn't enter the conversation of what? Of business, business ethics, trade, cryptocurrency, real world problems, banking, com you know, commercialization, um, what it means to actually build an institution, what it means to engage in, 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 um, in the structuring of a, of, a, of a state. And there are ways that Muslims actually have this conversation. Some say the state itself fully from beginning to end should be based on an Islamic preconceived notion of a, of a state as it happened in a specific space and time. And, I, you know, there's an argument to be made there, but I think a, a more healthier argument and a practical argument would be that the people engaged in statesmanship, in stateswomanship, in commerce, in trade, in defining foreign and internal affairs and all of these conversations that are happening on global levels should also be the ones that are trained in Islamic ethics, Islamic values, Islamic morals, and the Sharia. And it's up to us, this generation, to stop thinking about this dichotomy. Yes, as a sheikh or as a scholar, when you, when you study Islamic law and you study Islamic you know, Sharia, Islamic, uh, whatever aspect of the deen, and the fuqaha, we should be investing in them to also study secular law, to study you know, commerce, to study business, to study trade, to study psychology, to study uh, physiology, to study you know, medicine. Because if you go back into our tradition, the most successful of individuals that have left an impact were the polymaths. And yes, there's a lot of specialization. So it's difficult to be a polymath in this day and age, but you can at least be a specialist in whatever field you're in while also equipping yourself with the Islamic rules and regulations required for that specific field. And the place where this is becoming very clear is Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. Like that's an area, Islamic sociology is slowly catching up. Islamic politics is slowly catching up. The two areas where that is being done properly or at least tried and more people are entering, Islamic psychology and even more so Islamic banking and Islamic financing. And yes, there are going to be mistakes made along the way. There are going to be mistakes made along the way. But that's part of the process of development and part of the process of what? Of growth of growth. So this is an important lesson and an important reminder here that before we go to Medina, before we start the society, before we build the society, one of the things that we're going to focus on is the ethics of business and the ethics of trade. And to make a, a, like a bit of a tangent here, if you look at the seven of the 10 who are guaranteed Jannah, seven of the 10 companions who are guaranteed Jannah were businessmen. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ibn Affan, we talked about how Uthman ibn Affan or Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf's net worth was around, if you look into, like just compare from his time to our time, it would be around 50 billion US dollars. That was his net worth. And when he came to Medina, he had nothing. He had to leave everything behind. And his famous quote was, Dullani ala suq. Show me where the market is. Show me where the market is. And one of the earliest things that the Prophet Muhammad did when he came to Medina 
is he set a market specifically for Muslims. The Jews had their market, other communities had their market. So he said, you know what? The Muslims should also have their own marketplace to allow the currency to travel and allow the Muslims to also thrive. And one of the earliest things that the other businessmen didn't like was the Muslim market that was established in Medina. The Muslim market that didn't, was established in Medina. But slowly over time, because of the ethics and the business and the honesty, it became the most successful business and the most successful market. And eventually it spread to become the official and the only market in Medina. And all the other markets joined within this market. So like imagine when, when you look back into the history and see how this happened, it's amazing, very powerful. And if you look at the greatest scholars across the Muslim history, you will see that most of them were businessmen. The, like imagine how did Bukhari, how was he able to travel so much? Because he had money that was being sponsored by some of his family members that were businessmen. If you look, for example, at Al-Imam Malik, he was very wealthy, very wealthy, successful as a family of businessmen and businesswomen. If you look at Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his wife was a businesswoman, he was a businesswoman, his best friends, his best companions were businessmen, right? Khadija radiallahu anha, first sponsor of Islam, was a businesswoman. So business holds an, a very important and a central role in Islam and it should not be dismissed. And that's why one of the earliest things that we're going to focus on in the transition between Mecca to Medina is the importance of business trade. Business trade. And there are a hadith attributed to a Nabi وسلم, which are very important, in which he says, he says to them, be cautious of five for five. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what's five for five? He says, no people break their covenant except that Allah sends enemies over them. No one judges by whether the, other than what Allah has revealed except the poverty becomes spread amongst them. No one increases, or as a society, when fornication begins to spread, death will also spread among them. And no one defrauds and cheats and basically manipulates the market, except that their crops will begin to, to, to fail and they will be plagued with famine. And no community refuses to pay zakah, except that Allah will withhold rain from them. So there's a direct result or a direct connection between our shortcomings in our relationship with one another and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descending upon us, descending upon us. And if you look at a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's a hadith in which he goes into the market and there's, a like a, there's somebody who's selling, who's selling some fruit, something of some kind. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa puts his hand deep into the, 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 the bowl and he realizes that the bottom of the bowl is very wet. There's a lot of water. So he says to him, like, why is the top very beautiful? You put the best of your product on top. And then the very bottom is actually what? It's very, um, it's, it's gone wrong. It's gone bad. It's rotting. And he وسلم, says, don't do that. And he added, Man minna. whoever cheats us, whoever cheats others is not from us. So the act of cheating is not an act that belongs in the Muslim community. Can we, uh, can I get Hashim, can we get some more chairs for the brothers who are you know, standing at the back? Jazakumullah khair. Tamam? So he says, أَفَلَا جَعَلْتَهُ فَوْقَ الطَّعَامِ كَيْ يَرَاهُ النَّاسِ مَنْ غَشَّ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Why don't you put the, like the, the, like be fair, be transparent, show your product as it is. Don't have two different, you know, uh, supplies. One for the picture, and then one for what? One for what's actually going to be given. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ Who are these people? Allah further elaborates. الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ When they, listen to this carefully, اكْتَالُوا comes from كَيْل which means when they measure. But usually you don't say عَلَى النَّاسِ عَلَى implies above, on top of people. So even in the way that they're dealing with the measures, they have this arrogance as if they're standing on top of people. As if like I own the market. You're coming to me. You know, people have this attitude. SubhanAllah, one brother was mentioning to me a few days ago when he was working in a very good company, ethical company. The boss of the company, he pointed to his chair. And he says, do you see this chair over here? I said, yeah, we see it. He says, this chair is not possible. Do you see that door over there? He said, yes. 
He says, this chair is not possible without the work of everybody within and outside of that door. If people stop working, there's no chair. It falls. Meaning that you're the, you're, the, you're the core of the company. My job is just to help things flow. You're doing the actual work. But this individual who's cheating the market is thinking to himself, or himself, I am in charge. I am on top. These people need me. So I can charge higher and higher and higher and higher. And I can try to exploit further and further and further. So, When they are the ones that, when they are the ones that buy, they take full measure. And they have this arrogance. They have this arrogance. You need my money. And when they give, they have the arrogance. You need my product. Right? Now here's a beautiful subtlety in the language. Usually you're supposed to say, And when they weigh for them. But here it doesn't say, When they weigh them. Wait a second, you're not supposed to weigh the people, you're supposed to weigh the product. But when do you start taking advantage of the product and advantage of the transaction? When you weigh the people and you deem them to be what? To be not worthy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a play on the words here. وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ And when they judge the person, they see a person walking and they're like, oh, this person doesn't know anything about business. I can take advantage of them. Or this person is nice. I can take advantage of them. Or this person is too busy to actually go back and weigh and, you know, see the difference. Then how are they going to know? And plus, even if they know, are they really going to come back all the way to the market for, you know, tenth of a pound that is missing? So they're judging. They're, they're always judging people who are coming. They're weighing them. You know, you weigh the person. And you see, is this person going to overreact? Are they going to make a big deal out of it or can I get away with it? So having these dual standards, double standards in the way that you deal with people in general. You see somebody coming to complain, oh, is this person from the silent majority or from the loud minority? If they're from the loud minority, what are you going to do? Okay, okay, yes, you're going to give them the corporate smile and you're going to give them what they want. But if they're from the silent, people who are not going to make a big deal out of it, who are going to be patient and give you chance after chance, you're not going to make, you know, you're not, oh, it's okay. Just let it be, let it slide. And again, engage in a bit of taghafu. So that is not from the ethics of a Muslim, to have those double standards. So either kaluhum awazanuhum, when they weigh them or they measure them, they always give less. They give less than what they deserve. So it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding you, when you weigh that person and think that they're nothing, and think that they're not, right? They're less than what you what others are in your opinion, you're actually not, do, not giving them their full right. Not giving them their full share. So don't misjudge people. Don't missway people. Right? Don't, ju don't judge a person based on what they're wearing, coming to you and what. Treat everybody the same. And there are so many, ahadith, so many sayings attributed to the companions. And again, subhanAllah, this even is something that's very common in our modern culture. They will tell you the best companies that succeed are the ones where the caretaker and the lowest person in the hierarchy in terms of function, in terms of, you know, pay, is treated in the same way as the most valuable financially person in that company. If everybody is treated the same and receives that right and receives that attention, that's a success, that's a sign for success for that company. And that's what Nabi Wasallam did. He treated everybody the same. Actually, when, remember when the companions buried that cleaner in the masjid and they didn't tell him a cleaner in the masjid died and he didn't see her for a day or two after a while he asked where is she he said ya rasulullah she died and we know you're busy like, we took care of it it's like what do you mean you took care of it why didn't you tell me we thought it's not important you have so many things to do you're busy he's like no this is important this is important and he went and he prayed janaza himself in some narrations and he made dua for her and he continued to honor those that were relatives of her. Can you imagine where the person who is least known in the community, but or least appreciated, has that value and worth in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's eye? وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ Look at the questions, the rhetorical questions in the surah. Do they not think, these people, do they not think that they are already being sent. You know, here it says that they will be resurrected, but actually it's not 
will be. It doesn't say annahum sayub'athun. It doesn't say annahum yub. Like it says actually annahum mab'uthun. Annahum mab'uthun. They're already being sent. It's as if each and every one of us has a destination and we're already on our way to our destination. We're not escaping. Like it's not, it's not like it's not like we live and then we die. Like we're dying. We are dying now. Every minute that passes the minute of our battery that goes. So it's not like death is something that happens in the future. Death is something that's happening to each and every one of us right now. So don't defer the thought about death to, oh, it's something I'll deal with in the future. I'll deal with when I'm 50, 60, 70. It's happening to each and every one of us now. We're already being sent. We're already being prepared. We're already being, you know, it's like you send an email. You send that email. And it's sent, خلاص. the same thing, each and every one of us, the date of our resurrection, the date of our death is already set. It's already sent. That's not going to change. They're sent already, set already for a destination. And the destination is not just a place, but it's a time. A yawm means a, a unit of time that is عظيم, that is great. يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ All of the nas will be made to stand for the Lord of the worlds. Everyone will be standing, waiting for their account. There's no sitting. There's no resting. There's no like, imagine you're waiting in a line for an exam and you can't sit down. You'll be like, okay, I'll just wait. Can you hold my, my spot? I'll sit down here. I'll take a break and then I'll come join. No, everybody is made to stand. And this is again في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة A day that is equivalent to 50,000 years of our time. That's what the Prophet Muhammad Sallam described in the Quran, word by word describes. What a day, imagine standing for that long. And some people will get, some people will get their audit very quickly and that day will seem like seconds. Boom, quick, no, no account. And the end is Jannah without an account. And others, it will be very long. And that's part of the punishment itself to make them wait for so long that they're desperate. They're like, just give me my, just give me, I just want to go to Jahannam. Khalas. I know I'm going to go to just, just, okay, let's, let's get it done with. You know, when you're failing and you go, you know, you're failing, you go into the exam knowing you're failing, but there's three hours left. Everybody's like, okay, relaxing. Some people are studying the notes. You have no notes to study from. No notes. You made no notes. You're looking at everybody else who's asking. They're asking everybody like, oh, what do you think? Is it, is it really like, oh, what is the, did you draw the, everybody's speaking about the subtleties. They're like, oh dear Lord, what happened? Oh man. And so you're just like, khalas, I just want it to be over with. Let's just get this over with. I want to go home. And when you're writing an exam that's terrible, you have the same thing. I, I want it to be over. So some people will be actually standing, wanting it to be over, but Allah will make them wait further and further and further. And there's a hadith by Nabi Sallallahu in which he says, that the first people to enter Jannah are the poor. Why the poor? Because their account, their balance sheets are very what? Are very small. You know, when you're a multi-billion dollar company, your audit will take a long time. The auditors will take months. Sometimes they will take years. But when you're a small business, you got, you know, last year, zero income. Miskeen, COVID. Your, your, your audit is going to be very quick. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions that the first people to enter Jannah are going to be the poor because their account is very quick. They usually lived a very simple life. Possessions were simple. They, didn't really, they weren't in a position where they could hurt others. So there's no lineup of people waiting to get their rights back from you. But the rich, as a boss, every one of those people that worked for you, every imagine like subhanAllah, the, the concept of like a geo, like a global company, a multinational company. I feel bad for somebody who's in that position, even as a Muslim. But if they make it and they enter, they get the highest of Jannah. Because to have that much power and to be just and fair in that power, it comes with a big risk, but also a great gain. It comes with a big risk. Yes, it takes longer, but you get higher levels in Jannah if you were honest, if you were fair. Now, this is one of my favorite ayat here. You know, the commentators, when they're discussing these ayat, they, you could see that they're trying to figure out, like, what do these ayat actually mean? 
and they could have multiple meanings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a category now of people. Not the mutaffifin, but the fujjar. Remember the mutaffifin are the ones who do what? Little here and there, little here and there, and those get a really terrible position. But then he mentions here, Allah mentions the fujjar. The fujjar are not the ones who are doing little, but they're actually explosive in their injustice. So how do we go from someone who's doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that in the market to fujjar? That transition from someone who's cutting corners, someone who knows no corners, fujjar, fujur, explosive, is intended. Allah is saying the person starts cutting these corners, but very quickly before they know it, they engage in fujur every other aspect of their life. When they compromise in the little things, slowly it becomes a habit. It slowly becomes a characteristic. And when it becomes a characteristic, you know no bounds. You got away with the 2%, the 3%. Well, not, why not 10%? Why not 20%? Why not 50%? Why not launder money from here? Why not misuse money from here? So that mutaffif, and remember, it's not in the verb form. They're not doing it once or twice. Mutaffifin is in the noun form. So when something becomes in the noun form, it's not bound by time. So it becomes a part of you. And then that leads to fujur. It leads to explosiveness. It leads to basically going out of bound. Imagine water is contained, but in fijar, it basically explodes out of its boundaries. That's fujur. So someone who knows no boundaries is a fujar, a fajr, plural fujar. So Allah says, Kalla inna kitaba al fujari lafi sijil. The kitab, the account, the record, the book of the ones who transgress the wicked is in sijil. Sijin. And what is Sijin? Sijin comes from the word Sajana, which means to jail, to imprison, to be kept secret, closed, concealed, curbed, restrained, and also Sajana to trench, to dig, to basically hold into the ground. Now, what is what is what is what is being captured here? The record, kitab of this person is buried deep, 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 deep into the ground. What do you bury into the ground? Something that you don't want people to know. So it's as if this, again, this ayah is very powerful because it captures so many things. This person has their own records. They know the wrong that they've done. So they keep the records buried. They try to erase the data. They try to jail it. They try to imprison it. They try to restrain it. They don't want it to be public. And the angels who are keeping track of the record are so disgusted with their actions that their record is buried somewhere filthy, deep, deep, deep in a low place where it deserves to be. Imagine the images that are being captured. And kitab also means the audit. Like, the contract, the auditing. It's as if Allah says, the auditing of the fujjar on the day of resurrection will happen in the worst and in the lowest of places. The worst and the lowest of places. Can you imagine? So, Later on, we're going to discuss the difference in adraka and yudrika, but make a note, we'll discuss it later in the later surahs. And what will make you know what sijin is? When Allah mentions it in this form, it's as if Allah SWT is saying, yes, I'm describing something to you. You may get a glimpse using your imagination, but you'll never be able to know it fully until you experience it. So what will ever make you know what sijin is? You won't ever be able to imagine it using your human limitations. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا سِجِّينَ كِتَابٌ مَرْحُومٌ This here, is for me one of the most vivid and powerful images. Kitab again, talking about the book, the record. Marku means, it's not just written. Marku means when you have a lot of codes and fixing and, and it's, it's like you got all these codes. You know when you're writing a manuscript and you go back and you erase and you fix and you erase and you fix and you like you hand in an assignment and it comes back to you, no red marks. You hand in another assignment and it comes back to you full of red marks. Comments everywhere, wrong, good, good thought, but terrible conclusion, source, what do you mean, not understandable, right? 
Hopefully you don't get an essay back like that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as if the record of the fujjar comes back to them with red mark everywhere. You sold this one for 50,000. True price should have been 30. You lied, lie here, cheat here. Every little correction is being made on the line. Like you have the original, and on top of the original superimposed is the truth. And this is scary. This is an image that I imagine when filing taxes, right? Or when applying for any, anything. You know, you have your resume. Imagine you get your resume back as a part of your record with the real, the real words. Served in the company for 15 years. Served like what? Well, no one, know you. no one knew you. Imagine it's, it's, it's rewritten as, or like there's a, a line, a red line crossing, and then on top of that, never set a foot in that company. 2018, degree achieved. 2018, no degree achieved. GPA, 4.0. GPA, 2.1. Right? In the interview, this is the transcript from the interview. This is the actual transcript. This is what you should have said. So the angels are writing. And besides every claim you've made is the counterclaim that is true. Beside every distortion of fact that you've said or can, chip, contributed to. And that's why like truly, truly committed people don't like to talk. What, is it, what does a police officer advise you when... You get arrested. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. And Nabi Sallallahu when he was described, they said, and he was the most extensive in his silence. Like he would sit there silently and he wouldn't say much. But when he would say it's sufficient, right? He says they described him as having the most comprehensive and concise of speech. And then you have in every culture, you have these sayings, the person who talks the most, makes the most mistakes, be careful of someone who speaks very, very fast, be among the company of those who monitor their language, they're slow in their speech, right? And this is, subhanAllah, this is a sign of somebody who's what? Who's holding himself and herself accountable, monitoring every word before it's said. And that's why you have, subhanAllah, some of the greatest scholars that I know, some of the greatest scholars that have had the pleasure of meeting, and the greatest teachers, they don't like to speak. They don't like to get on the mimba. They don't like to give khutbahs. They don't like to give halaqas. They don't. They do it and in their hearts they're sad. They're like someone else should be doing this but I'm feeling a void that exists. Which is going to leave the community to get darker and darker and more ignorant. So I'm feeling a void being in a position that I know I don't deserve to be in. Saying things that I know I might like I'm putting myself. Imagine the person who's sitting here to teach they're, they're, they're compromised. Listen to this. They're putting themselves at jeopardy with Allah because if they say one thing that is not true intentionally about Allah, imagine the red mark with the correction on top and the explanation and the incident timestamps. And you understand the gravity, the gravity of the situation. Every claim that is made. And this doesn't just apply to the teacher, it applies to all of us. Imagine the phone conversation that you're having. The transcript of the phone conversation, what you said and the truth. Oh, brother, you know how you invested the money? I'm so sorry. I lost it all. But inshallah, if Allah wills, I'll try to. And you actually bought with the money a house of your own or did whatever or did X, Y, Z. Every claim is being written. And marqoom means what? Marqoom means like coded, coded, different colors, time stamped, all of these different amendments. That is what is imagined. Kitabu Marqum also means a record that is written, could be a record that is written, or a fate, because kataba could mean a contract or a fate, maktub, something that is written, destined. Marqum already sealed. Meaning that they will be held accountable in the lowest of Jahannam, a, a fate that is sealed, that is done, that is not to be edited or altered or changed or uh, contributed to. And also Kitab al could mean it's closed. So you have this audit, you have the corrections, 
and it's closed, it's sealed, you can't go back. Because what someone can say, well, I'm going to go back and get the notes and erase. I'm going to go and erase, manually erase all the bad, all the red things or read. No, it's done. It's, it's, خلاص, it's written. You have no access to it. Marqoom. يَشْهَدُهُ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ كِتَابُ مَرْقُومُ وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ وَيْلٌ again, the punishment in Jahannam or the curse invoked in the dunya. Wail on that day to the mukaddibin, to the deniers. So who denies? Who denies? What are they denying first? Yukaddibuna alladheena yukaddibuna biyawm al-deen. They are the ones that deny the day of deen, the time of deen. Let's break a few things down here. Who remembers we talked about deen? What does deen mean? Yawm al-deen. What does deen mean? Hmm? Okay, deen like Dana, it could be a way of life. Dana, do you know? Yes, Hashim? Exactly. So it's the day in which the audit takes place and the account is set, the balance is set clear. But deen also could be associated with the clearing of balance in the slightest, the smallest, the tiniest of scales. So when you set a balance clear to the precise T, to the dot, that is deen. Okay? So that, so, who do you think is going to deny the day of resurrection, the day in which all the balances are set? Who's going to deny that? The one who is most corrupt. Because they, they, they just, it's, they wouldn't survive otherwise. You know what happens? Let's say you, you, uh, you know, cognitive dissonance. Let's say, for example, you invest some money and you lose the money. What do you tell yourself? Oh, I never wanted it in the first place. Oh, the 20,000, it's just extra, it's cash, uh, not, not important. You don't get into the school that you, you know, that you wanted to get into. Before you're like, please, 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 you don't get in. What do you say? Oh, it's a bad school anyway. You know, uh, they had the highest suicide rates or they have this, or, you know. So you start actually focusing on denying, denying that you want it to be there and denying that it exists. That's the extent to which these people will go. What are you talking about? Day of resurrection. Come on, man. These are little stories that people tell themselves. This is a form of population control. This is a form of like getting weak, feeble-minded people to believe in things because people are always looking for patterns. It's encoded within the human nature. It's, you know, people want to make meaning. So these are just ways for the simple-minded to feel comfortable, to feel at ease with the injustice of the dunya. What other way to be okay with injustice in the dunya? Except to believe that it's eventually going to in a utopia in another world that you're after all be set clear. I don't believe in that. I believe you only have one life and it's here. And guess what? It's for those who are willing to take risks. And when you take risks, you're bound to make mistakes. And when you're bound to make mistakes, it's normal that you're going to have victims. You just got to keep going. So the people who, and subhanAllah, this is a level of harshness that some people have. And what's amazing is you will find some of the harshest people, and this is based on my own experience, the harshest people I've met are businessmen, businesswomen, and some of the softest people I've met are businessmen and businesswomen. The business can make you some of the nicest people that exist, and it can make you some of the harshest, the coldest, the most despicable people to be around. Because it can give you a false sense of security, or can give you the resources to be able to contribute and to make a difference and to actually change people's lives, which gives you this peace and, and, and comfort in knowing that you've made a difference. It can make you this and it can make you that. And think about Fir'aun and Qarun and Haman and, and, and others. Think about Dhul Qarnayn and Sulaiman and Dawood, right? Subhanallah. So it can make you both. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is making where the Quran here is presenting a claim that those who deny the day of judgment, they deny the resurrection, they deny the account, is because they stand to benefit and they can't stand to believe in that day. Because otherwise they wouldn't engage in those behaviors. If they knew that there's a day in which all the balances are set clear, do you think they're gonna lie and steal and ch change and alter the, you know, the balance here and there? They wouldn't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alladheena and no one would deny this except the Mu'tad and the Athim. 
Mu'tad means transgressing, and Athen means sinful. So the only people who deny this are going to be the ones who constantly transgress others' rights, steal, manipulate others' rights, and they engage in sin, not just once or twice. You know, when I say somebody who understands fiqh, and someone who really, really understands fiqh, I say faqih. Faqih, alim. There's alim, someone who knows, and there's alim. Someone who really, really knows. So here, a theme is in the intense form. This is not just a theme, it's a theme. It's not just someone who's sinful. It's someone who's sinful over and over and over and over and over again to a point where what happened, what happened to them? What happened to them? Kalla bal, the ayah that will come after will explain what happened to them. But here Allah says, إِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِ آيَاتُنَا قَالَ أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ When our ayat are recited to them, and tutla also means follow. When the signs of Allah follow them, and when the ayat of Allah recited to them, the Quran is recited to them, the signs of Allah come to them, they say, asatir comes from satara, stories, fables of the past, ancient tales. They say, these are just stories of the past. These are ancient tales, ancient lines. This is not true. These are ancient tales. Kalla bal. Listen to this carefully. Allah says, but no. No, this is not an ancient tale or fable. بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ The stains that they have earned have covered up their hearts, forming a layer around their hearts that prevents them from feeling. Imagine the person who steals over and over again, tries to cut those corners. What happens to their heart? Layers begin to form around their hearts that prevent them from having insight that prevent them from seeing, that prevent them from feeling, that prevent them from connecting with the Qur'an. And so remember how those who say we want signs, the signs are not going to change the darkness that has engulfed the heart, which is why Allah says, no, you need to change. When you change your internal, you will be able to see the signs. So the signs are already there, but your capacity to see and perceive is gone. And what did a Nabi Wasallam say? He says, Sometimes, you know, there will come a shade over my heart. You know, when you, you know, sometimes there are harsh moments, difficult moments, confrontations, really difficult days, the stress, it, it actually weakens you. It makes you what? It makes you less, less what? Less ready to help, less ready to, you know, when you're having a bad day and someone comes and asks you, like, it, it's, it's hard. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have the Ram, but he had like, a, some, he said, say, some days, there would be a small layer of shade that would overcome my heart. So I would begin to do istighfar and I would engage in qiyam and Allah would remove it. Allah would remove it. So imagine what happens. Listen to this carefully. What happens when you have a cup of milk and it's fully bright and fully clear? You add a little bit of dye, you'll feel it right away. You'll see the change of color. But what happens when you, over, when you put dye over and over again? It reaches a point where you don't begin to feel it anymore. So some people, like Nabi Sallallahu their hearts are so pure that if there's any little thing that begins to even form around, they feel it, they recognize it, they fix it, they purify it, and they move on. But others, they have so many layers of darkness around their heart that they've become accustomed to it, they've normalized it, and they think this is just the way that everybody feels. This is the way that everybody is. This is the norm. I don't know anything else but this. So imagine reaching a point where there's so much darkness that you can't even feel the darkness. You don't even know that it's there. And what happens when you transition from a high iman to low iman? You'll feel yourself at the beginning. You'll feel the loss. But over time, we're human beings, we forget. You just become accustomed to the new norm. And that's part of our survival instinct. Imagine if we didn't forget. If we didn't forget the past, we wouldn't be able to go to sleep from the horrors that we'd have to remember and relive over and over again. From the stress that we'd have to relive over and over again. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put protective mechanisms in us to allow us to forget the guilt, to forget the past, to forget the pain, to forget the sorrow, to forget the trauma and to cope and to move on. But shaitan will use this against us and get us to imagine that the new beginning of darkness, this new life of darkness that was never there, you'll begin to convince yourself that it's always there. Maybe this is just me. Maybe this is who I am. And shaitan will tell you that. Yeah, it's who you are. You're corrupt. You're too late now. Keep going. Keep going. 
to get you to go further and further into the darkness. And what's the punishment that these people are going to get? They're going to have a hijab, a barrier between them and Allah on the day of resurrection as they had a barrier between them and Allah in this world. The darkness prevented them from connecting, knowing Allah, loving Allah, believing in Allah. And because they disconnected from Allah in this dunya, Allah disconnects from them in the akhirah. And they don't get to see Allah. And based on this ayah, they say, some of the scholars say, that based on this ayah, like a Shafi and others, and ayat in the surah as well, they say that this means that every believer will eventually be able to experience Allah directly. And this is mentioned in Surah, um, in Surah Al-Qiyamah. There are days on that day that are going to be fully bright, directly looking at the face of the Lord. Imagine the day when you get to see Allah's face directly. Imagine the day when you get to see the Lord who created you, sustained you, the Lord that you prayed to for years, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, you've prayed without ever seeing him. You believed without seeing him. You connected, you've, you've had this relationship that was real, but you've never been able to see fully. The hijab is lifted, the veil is lifted, and you get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that I will never be able to and the mind will never be able to imagine or conceive in the dunya, but it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises all of us in the akhirah. With this, let us take, inshallah, a quick break, like a five minute stretch break. You can stretch around, inshallah, and then we'll come back to continue, bi Allah ta'ala, and hopefully, bi Allah ta'ala, complete the commentary on the surah. So, inshallah, please do walk around, stretch around so we have some energy, and we'll come back and continue, inshallah. Go ahead, go ahead. Which ayah? Ayah, which which number? This one? Yeah. Okay. You got it. No problem. Yes. Could you hook me up? Sure. Yes, of course. No problem. I've been blessed, alhamdulillah. How have you been? Turn your camera on. Mm -hmm. And click. Yeah, just face this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just here. And so just click here. No problem. Let's just do it this way. It's not the camera itself. It's, it's easier to just join through the link. Can you send them the link? Yeah, Hashim? Just send me your They'll link. give you the link. You can, can you join by the link, here? inshallah. Just put your number here. Uh, I can just text this to you. Uh, yeah. So, a lot of people from the team, right? So, a lot of them have never been to this before. So, Maybe saying, hey, you don't have the notes. This is how you're going to get it. Uh, sure. Don't feel left out. There's a WhatsApp sure. group. Yeah. How, so a lot of people are asking me how to get the Zoom. Like, a Zoom every like, Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. No, got it. Second like, like, at least 20, 30 minutes. I don't know what you're doing. Fine. Perfect. So, Perfect. Second Oh, you're so nice. Thank you so much. Second May Allah give you from the rivers of Jannah. Second Thank you so much. Yes. Sorry? No, it's perfect. Perfect. Thank you, man. Second Lakhe. I love this one. I love you too. Zaka Bakhe. I love you too, bro. Zaka Bakhe. Can't join into this group because the invite link was reset. Sheikh, did you reset the invite link? Yes, I did. 
Oh my lord. Okay, can you can you send me the link again? It's okay, it's okay. I, I know, I know. That's what I'm going to do, inshallah, and then I'm going to try to get, send it to everyone. No worries. I, I'm going to go around. I'm just going to have my QR code for the brothers, and all of them can scan it for me. But uh, you have to send the notes again, because WhatsApp doesn't let you see this thing. Okay. For those of you who are asking about the notes, Hashim is going to go around. He's going to have the link available and the QR code. If you don't have access to the WhatsApp group, we'll give you access now so you can access the notes. And then, inshallah, you can, you can inshallah, there you go. Perfect. So Saif is going to put the notes, inshallah, again on the, on the group. Jazakumullah khair, Saif. Safe. You can use this QR oh, code. Perfect. This is way better. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I do. How are you? Yes, I do. Of course. Yeah. Keep halak. How are you? It's been okay. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. Good to see you. Bazaakallah khair. Barakallah khair. And for those of you who are live, this is the right hand. It's just the camera is flipped, mirror. All right. If anyone wants to join the WhatsApp group with the notes, Hashim is there. He has the QR code. You can join, inshallah. And inshallah, to make, to make the class uh, more engaging, inshallah, we're going to have some snacks on the side next week. So if you'd like to bring some tea or coffee or some fruits, you can contribute, inshallah, so that brothers and sisters can eat uh, during the break to be able to sustain the energy, inshallah. Assalamualaikum, kif halik? How are you? And the hub has coffee. If anybody wants to go to the hub, there are coffee and uh, tea and croissants and uh, patties and lots of other things. Yes, yes. Assalamualaikum, how are you, mashallah? How are you, Ukhti? Good to see you. Alhamdulillah. So, yeah, so the angel, some, some of the commentators say that the angels take the book of record itself and they take it to the lowest of place is because um, that's again a manifestation of the lowliness of them, you know, so does that make sense? So they themselves try to bury it in the lowest of places so that no one can get it and the angels bury it in the lowest or take it to the lowest places, store it in the lowest places because of um, because of uh, the the they devalued Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they get to de devalue and their book of deeds are devalued as well. They, yeah some some say the yeah the angels out of disgust with the deeds that were done they they take it to the lowest of places and some say that's actually referring to the account itself the account will happen in the lowest places okay alaikum how are you how old are you six years old mashallah the hub is where the old bookstore is for those of you who are asking. Six years old and you're here taking notes? MashaAllah. Yeah. Masha Good for you. MashaAllah. Good to see you. Yeah. When you said that, everything is... How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Give me one second. Yeah. You said everything is written down. Right? Everything mm -hmm. is recorded. Right? When you're forgiven from sin, is it raised or is it there? It's like a question mark. So I got the asterisk says forgiven. Yeah. So... Um, some say that it's completely forgiven and erased, yeah. right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might like show you your record and it's never going to be publicized. So just you know, like you get to see, it, you yeah. know what happened. Like it's there in case you forget it. And then some say that it actually, like Allah forgives it, deletes it, and, for, and deletes the impact of the sin even on your own psyche or your, 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 your being. Yeah? I just wonder because like, I think you're always forgiven. So yeah, yeah. Have, yeah, like, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. How are you? How are you, Ukhti? Good to see you. How are you, Habibi? Good to see you. Mashallah. What's your name? Isa. Isa. Mashallah. How are you, Isa? Okay. I was wondering if I could volunteer in an IT class. Sure. Yeah. At, at the end of the class, just go to Hashim. He will set you up with the volunteering team. Zakamullah. Thank you so much. Sorry? 
Oh, well, your voice is so nice too. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you. You're very kind. All right, Bismillah. Let's sit down, inshallah, and let's continue with the letter. Alright, <laughs> So we continue, inshallah, with the second portion of the surah, surah al mutaffifin And again, the ayat are very, very, very beautiful, very powerful. We discussed how the people who are denying the existence of Allah, denying the re revelation, denying resurrection, because they deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah denies them. Nasullah fa nasihum, nasullah fa ansahum and fusum. They forgot Allah, so Allah forgot them. They forgot Allah, so Allah made them forget themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, innahum an rabbihim yawma idin la mahjubu. On that day, they will not be able to see Allah. Thumma innahum la salul jaheem. And they will continue after not being able to see Allah, which is a punishment in itself that is severe. 
they will be exposed over and over again continuously to the jaheem, to the hellfire. And then they will be told, this is what you used to deny. This in front of you is what you used to deny. This is Jahannam. Hmm? This is Jahannam that you used to deny. Right? This is Jahannam that you used to deny. You are going to now engage in it and get to see it right in front of your eyes and get to experience it. Whereas the book of the record of the Abrar, remember we talked about Barara and Abrar last time, the super plural, we talked about it. So these are the most righteous, the most committed of people. The people didn't engage in the actions of the Mutafifin and the Pujjar. These are the people of commitment and ethics and integrity. Their book of records will be lifted to the highest of the high. Illiyin. So imagine the angels will take the records of the good to the highest of places until you meet Allah. Where imagine after you die, your book of deeds, where do they go? They're shut. The lowest people and the terrible fujjar, their book of deeds go to the lowest of low, as we said. And the book of deeds of the most righteous will go to the highest of the high, waiting for the day of resurrection for them to be presented back to them. <laughs> And how will you ever realize what this beautiful high place, the elevated, the rising place is? You'll never be able to see it or understand it or know it until you see it in the Akhirah. So you won't see it in this dunya. You won't understand it. It becomes an abstract concept in your mind until you get to see it with your own eyes. Kitabun marqum, the record of the deeds of these righteous people is also going to have a lot of what? A lot of writing, a lot of comments. But are these going to be comments of correction or comments of amazement? Comments of amazement. How many of you have worked so hard on an essay? You spend like five months and then the teacher gives you back A plus, good work. But how do I know that you actually read it? Or like 82. Why did I get 82? Why didn't I take 83? Where did I go wrong? Why didn't I take 85? Why didn't I get 90? Right? Like, it's arbitrary, like 50 or 100 pages of work, and there's not a single comment on any of the pages. And imagine you get an essay back, and the person who marked it commented on every little word. Amazing. Really, this reminds me of blah, 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 blah. This reminds me of this. This is great. Wonderful. Great. So the book of deeds of the righteous will have this commentary. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Yashhadu al-muqarrabun. The most close to Allah witness it. They get to open and see it. So the angels get to gather in the hadith that is authentic and they discuss the actions of the believers. There's a hadith in which Nabi Sallallahu said the angels take two shifts, Asr and Fajr. And they meet each other on the way. And they say how the first angels will say, imagine the first shift is taking the book of records, Right? The book of deeds taking it above or in the, in the exchange, they ask, how did you leave Muhammad and Ali? Well, I left Muhammad praying. I left Muhammad sleeping, but his intention was to rest so he could get up and pray. I left Muhammad actually giving a khatr. I left Muhammad in a uh, position reciting the Quran. I left Fatima where she's helping his sister out. And they're like, wow, I'm excited to see what they do today. And then the opposite. How did you leave? Uh, no need to mention name. X. Oh, you... I don't even want to tell you. Go find out for yourself. I'm too ashamed to tell you. You have a, you have a gruesome night ahead of you. Like, well, how bad is it? Oh, it's much, much, much more than what it was last night. Much more than what it was last week. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that the angels will get to, or the nearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will get to read this and get to comment on it and get to be amazed by it. And there's a hadith in which the Nabi Sallallahu says, your actions are, are told to me on Thursdays. And that's why you're encouraged to fast on Thursdays. And Nabi Sallallahu says in another hadith also, this question is about the authenticity of the one that I just mentioned, but this one is pretty authentic, that Nabi Sallallahu says that the actions are told in front of a, a large gathering on the Thursdays and Mondays, which is why I fast those days so that my suhuf are lifted in a state where I'm fasting. 
So at least the first thing that is mentioned is we left them in a position where they're fasting. What did they do? What's the first thing they did? They made the intention at Fajr to fast. And so the whole day they're incurring rewards just by being in that state. Subhanallah. يَشْهَدُهُ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ كَلَّا يَشْهَدُهُ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ عَلَى الْأَرَائِكِ يَنْظُرُونَ تَعْرِفُ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ نَظْرَةَ النَّعِيمِ Very powerful three ayat connected to each other. إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ The righteous people are already in Naim. Naim comes from Ni'ma, Nu'uma, tranquility, softness. The righteous are already experiencing comfort and luxury. We talked about when the Quran mentions this as if it's already happening. What does it mean? It's as if it's a guaranteed, it's done. They've already sealed their fate. Some people have done such good things that Allah has taken it upon Himself to protect them and sends angels to protect them so they die upon that state. And they meet Allah upon that state. They live on that state. They die upon that state of goodness. And they meet Allah upon that state of goodness. Who knows what the action. Maybe subhanAllah you donate or you help an orphan. His, his uncle who can't take care of him because he's disabled. Makes dua for you. May Allah give you Jannah al firdaus That dua is accepted in that moment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels that protect you. They encourage you. That, that give you the support required to live a life of goodness from that moment on. And so your, your fate is set. You're going to experience comfort in the dunya and comfort in the akhirah. And others say they are reclining on couches, gazing around, meaning that this is happening in the akhirah. Allah gives them a position of comfort where they're sitting back, relaxing, looking. What are they looking at? What are they looking at? Who can tell me what are they looking at? In the, what, the, the kuffar and an rabbihim yawma'idhin la mahjubun. They don't get to see Allah, the kuffar, the fujjar. So who, what are they looking at? Allah doesn't even mention here that they're looking at the Lord. But it's inferred that they're reclining back, getting to gaze at their Lord. Ta'arifu fi wujuhihim nadrat al naim Look at this ayah. Allah tells you, you will know from their faces the radiance of the bliss. So Allah doesn't tell you what they're looking at, but Allah tells you when you see their faces, you will know what they're looking at. Does that make sense? I don't need to tell you what they're looking at because when you see their faces and you see that glow, you will realize that the only way that this glow is there is because they're looking at something and someone that transcends any form of beauty that you could imagine, any form of light that you could conceive. That they're looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. When you have difficult days, tough days, imagine this day here. When you go through days in which you're not given the credit that you deserve, you're not acknowledged, you're not respected, you're disrespected, you're hurt, you're in pain, you're crying, the most closest of people to you have hurt you, have abandoned you, have broken you. Remember that there's going to be a day in which you're reclining on these beautiful seats, getting to look at the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, and the radiance will be seen. You know, you see somebody after looking at the sun for a while, like, oh, where did you get a tan? I know you went to tan. It's obvious. Like, I, I see it. You went to tan. I see the reflection of the, or the sun. I see it. Now, the same thing for the, the one who's always gazing at the face of the Lord, they will have that radiance. In this dunya, you don't get to see the face of Allah, but you can experience the nur of Allah, especially in Qiyam. At night when you're praying between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, like we said last time, Ibn al-Qayyim, he mentions there's a Jannah, a paradise in this dunya. The person who doesn't enter will not enter the paradise of the next. And that is the Jannah, the paradise of the dhikr of Allah. When was the last time you just sat down and just said, Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah, and highlighted the sins that you've committed to humble yourself, to remind yourself of your shortcomings, and you just repeated Astaghfirullah. When was the last time that you stayed in, 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 in sujood the whole night? Let's be honest. Every one of us has pulled an all-nighter in their life. Either playing video games, either studying for an exam, either stressing, either preparing for something. I have a big presentation tomorrow. 
I really need to work on this. It's big, like $5 million and on the line. So every one of us has done an all-nighter for the sake of someone or something or a company or a grade. But how many of us have pulled, not an all-nighter, a portion of the nighter for the sake of Allah? There's a hadith that is authentic. There's an, you know how there's an hour every Friday, some say after Asr, in which dua is accepted. There's an hour every night. This hadith is authentic. In which your dua is accepted without compromise. And either you get it in this dunya or you get it in the akhirah. Which is why the earliest advice you will get when you study Islamic sciences, the, 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 the teacher will tell you. I remember my teacher, he told me when I was telling him, I really want this, I really want this, I really want this. I said, I'm something that I really desire. I really want it. Like I'm, I'm dreaming about it. And he told me, the question that he asked, did you make qiyam asking Allah for this? I told him, no, I didn't. He said, then you don't really want it. You don't really want it. If you really wanted it, you would have put yourself and your head in that ground, on that ground. And you don't come out except having poured your heart out to Allah, asking over and over and over and over and over again for it. And I don't think you will see someone who habitually does that, except that Allah will give them what they're looking for or better than what they're looking for. And eventually what happens when you engage in that consistently, you get to, you get to realize that Allah keeps giving you more than what you deserve. So you, you actually enter a point where you say in your dua, Ya Allah, yeah, listen to this. You will say, Ya Allah, give me what you know to be best for me. You reach a point where you don't even ask Allah for things by name. It's good too. But some people reach a point of being humbled with Allah where they just say, Ya Allah, I know you're going to give me anything that I ask for, but I ask that you choose for me because your choice is better than mine. And that's why someone that can, you know, I remember once this brother, like just a few days ago, this brother came to the masjid. He's having a very difficult time, difficult relationship. He's trying to get married to the sister and, you know, the parents are making it difficult. So... He tells me, make dua for me, Brother Hussain. I'm like, yeah, may Allah give you the best for you. He's like, no, 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 don't, don't make that dua. I want you to make the following dua. What's the dua? Let's say her sister's name is Noor, just as a random name. Say, may Allah give me Noor. I'm like, you know, don't, don't specify. He's like, no, I know her to be good for me. This is what I want. I'm like, may Allah give you good for you. He's like, no, I want noor, man. Come on. SubhanAllah. I'm like, may Allah give you the light in the dunya and the light in the akhirah that will allow you to understand that noor may not be the best for you. Yeah, sister noor. But the noor of Allah, that is better than the noor of anybody else. Yeah? Just because sometimes you're so emotionally invested into something, you don't see. You don't see the implications. You don't see it, but Allah does. Allah sees beyond the limited. So that's why don't have i'tida in the dua. Don't have the arrogance in the dua. Ya Allah, I know exactly what is good for me. I want this, I want this, I want this. Actually, you should be saying, Ya Allah, the istikhara. Ya Allah, if you know Noor to be good for me, for my deen, for my akhirah, for my world, for my dunya, for my hereafter, give her me and give me her and allow us to be satisfied with each other and content with each other. But if you know her not to be... I'm not making that dua. I'm married, alhamdulillah. My wife is going to be watching. It's like, who's Noor, Ya Shaykh? <laughs> Allah al so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خلاص, let's move on. تَعْرِفُ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ نَظْرَةَ النَّعِيمِ يُسْقَوْنَ مِنْ رَحِيقٍ مَخْتُونَ يُسْقَوْنَ They themselves are not drinking. يُسْقَوْنَ means that they are the ones that are presented drinks to. So they don't have to move anything. The drinks are being served to them. Imagine reclining, communicating with Allah, and there are beings coming around to serve you. Rahiq, Rahiq, Rahiq is an amazing word which means exquisite drink with a beautiful like nectar, a beautiful taste. Makhtu means sealed. You know, subhanAllah, way before, you know, back in the day, before we had companies that, you know, uh, you know, imagine the concept of a can, a can that you click, it opens, and as it opens, it lets this, you know, beautiful fragrance out. The sound is like satisfying. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying they're given drinks that are sealed. Meaning that the drinks, the cups have never been opened before. If Muslims read this and imagined it, we should have been the ones to invent the cans, man. We should have been the ones to, 
You know, there's so much imagery in the Quran. You know, I, I remember once I was speaking with one of my friends, I said, SubhanAllah, why have Muslims not invested in resorts? Like, why is it always like the others are investing in resorts and the idea of like comfort in the because subhanAllah, this this stuff, there's so much imagery in the Quran. Of course, our Jannah is not in the dunya, but at least as a business model, there's so much imagery, the rivers flowing and the images of paradise. Why did the Muslims not, you know, in, in, invent those sooner? And some of them did. If you look at the Ottomans, if you look at the Mamluks, if you look at, you know, but usually they were not for public. They were for the sultans and whatnot. But sometimes they would build this, the, 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 the hospitals in a way where there were these, again, beautiful gardens and beautiful things that were given to, to, to be a part of the healing process. But Rahiq al Maktu means these drinks of nectar and beautiful wine. Wine is haram in the dunya, but halal in the akhirah. Yeah, alhamdulillah, wine has never been a fitna for me. May Allah protect me. Rabbah, ameen, ameen, ameen. I don't know what the big deal is. Alhamdulillah, Some, everybody's fitness is different. But in the akhirah, wine will be one of the main drinks of Jannah. With no side effects. You don't get tipsy, you don't get drowsy, you don't start messing around. You enjoy the full taste. And it's sealed specifically for you not to be open, open by anyone except you. رحيق مختوم ختامه مسك وفي ذلك فليتنافس المتنافسون Now, you know sometimes you drink a drink, the top is really nice, but then it loses taste after a while. And some drinks you have to shake. The bottom is very sweet if you don't shake it. And then it becomes too concentrated at the bottom so you don't enjoy it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is a drink that is sealed for you. The top is beautiful. And khitamuhu at the very bottom. You get to experience beautiful taste at the beginning, the nectar and the misk, this beautiful musk, this beautiful taste also that happens at the very end. So it leaves you wanting more. It leaves you desiring more. And in Jannah, there are no limits. You don't have one, two, three, four, and then you get tired of it. Every taste is as if though you're tasting it for the first time. Imagine that the first, just let that sink in. Imagine the first time you were tasting mangoes. You know those Pakistani mangoes or the Egyptian mangoes. Whatever, imagine your favorite fruit, your favorite drink. No need to mention any company names, yeah? This is not free marketing here. But imagine you're drinking your favorite drink and the first time that you taste it, you're like, Allah, what is this, man? Where have you been my whole life? Right? I don't know if I told you before, there was a guy, he said, I used to have doubts about the existence of Allah until I ate the Pakistani mango. Then I believed Allah exists. It spoke to me, man. I'm like, alhamdulillah, Allah, true story. I, 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 started, I started having full conviction in the existence of Allah when I tasted it. I'm like, whatever it takes, whatever your sign, whatever your sign. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying the, khita, the, the final taste will be taste of musk. وَفِي ذَٰلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافِسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ Ya Allah, look at the image. And let the competitors compete in this. What did we open the surah with? The marketplace. What drives the people to cut corners? The competition. It's a competitive market, man. It's difficult to survive. Otherwise, I got to do what I got to do. That's how people justify it. So Allah is saying, don't let the, you're competitive by nature. All of you human beings, you have the survival instinct. You want to survive. You want to have the best of the... I put that in you. But dunya is not the place of survival. Real survival is in the akhirah. Right? Who truly succeeds as business people? Business people, the successful businessmen and businesswomen, what are they going to say to you? They're going to say, you want to be successful? Stop spending money where you shouldn't be spending. Successful people don't spend money on like random, I'm not going to buy a $500 shoe and you know, $700 watch. They, they don't do that. They save their money and they invest it. So I want to retire by the age of 30. I want to retire by the age of 20. I want to have a good retirement plan. I want to be financially independent when I'm 35. Right? So I got to save my money so that I have a bigger buyout. I have more to invest. And then when I have that passive income of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 a month coming in, then I can live off of that and enjoy luxury back into my future. That's a smart businessman, a businesswoman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the same thing. Use that mentality to actually invest in the real thing. This dunya is not where the buy-off is. This dunya is not where the real balance is. This dunya is not where the real 
Success is, this dunya is not where the absolute happiness and joy is. So why live temporary? Why buy a million, ten million dollar mansion when it's nothing compared to what you have in the akhirah? Right? How many of us are paying it forward? How many of us are investing? How many of us are thinking about the day in which we're reclining and that passive service is coming to us because of the work that we've invested and the good that we've done? So Allah is saying, let the competitors compete in this. Let them drive one another. Right? Let them compete in goodness. Your brother donates 10,000. You know what? I'm going to do the same but privately. You see somebody doing good. Whenever you see somebody doing good around you, take a note. Wow. Man, I, I love that subtlety. I learned from that subtlety. Right? I just saw somebody's ethics, somebody's integrity, somebody's goodness. You're learning, you're monitoring. Like, man, this person's honesty. This person's, I saw the way this person is lowering the gaze. I saw like when you see a sister who is confident, presents herself with confidence, presents the hijab in a respectful way, but maintains that respectful dialogue, the professionalism. There's no flirtation. There's no, you know, nonsense. It's just professional, straight to the point, courteous, respectful. I'm just, you're like, wow, mashallah, tabarakallah. You may not say anything to her directly, but deep inside you make dua for her. Be like, you know what? You have just given me an example of what I want to invest in my daughter, what I want to invest in my sister, right? You've given me a concrete example of what that looks like. You've given me a practical example of what honesty looks like, what integrity looks like, what fulfilling your word looks like, what amana looks like. And I want to embody that and I want to strive. Not you go to, subhanAllah, what we do in the dunya is we do the opposite. We don't care. You see somebody doing a good job, mashallah. Not my problem. You go see somebody else's house. Oh, did you see the pool? Did you see, oh my God, where did you get that idea? Did you see the, did you see the, the jacuzzi? You know, I went to, I was doing house, uh, you know, some, some sisters, they will, they will like start their day, and brothers, they will start the day by looking at real estate houses. They're not buying or, or selling. They're just looking to get inspired for the next project in the house. Some of you are laughing because you know who you are. Like your routine. Three hours of your morning is spent on this. And then you, the husband comes home, Habibi, how are you doing? I know you've had a 10-hour day at work, but guess what? Look, this is what I need you to spend the next two months working on. And then once you've done that, look. And then once you've done that, look. And once you've done that, look. Some people live for that. And others, they're like, oh, by the way, you know, sometimes you have a wife or a husband who will do the same in acts of the akhirah. By the way, can we start saving up $2,000 a month, $2,210? Why? Because this is a project that I really want to invest in next month. And then the month after that, I want to invest in this project. And the month after that, I want to invest in this project. And the month after that, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want... How many of us have that competitive attitude in the khair? And notice the word yatanafas in mutanafisun. Yatanafas comes from nafis. Something that is valuable. Something that has a high value. So let the competitors compete with high energy in that which actually has value. That whose value actually stays. We'll finish with this because I love this ayah. Wamizajuhu. Min tasneem. We'll finish actually the two ayat because they're connected. Aynan yashrabu biha al-muqarrabun. Ya Allah. Mizaj. Mizaj. So, I was actually struggling to explain this. And I was reading some of the mufassirun. And it's, it's difficult. Like, it's difficult to actually understand what they're saying. But then, subhanAllah, I saw a brother ordering. I've been thinking, well, how am I going to explain this? And I saw a brother ordering a drink from Starbucks. Uh, not Starbucks. Uh, Tim Hortons. And then he asked for a strawberry shot in the drink. Or a raspberry shot. You know when you have the drink and then you add the shot? The shot could be like some, you know, some drinks, very small amount. But then the shot diffuses. And if you've had the drink before the shot and after the shot, it's like a completely different drink. That's what mezaja means. Mezaja means to add just the right amount that takes the drink. We're already talking about the drink of what? This, this uh, beautiful drink, what did we call it? Rahit al Yeah? This beautiful wine that has a beautiful uh, nectar 
And now there's a shot on top of it. That is min tasneem, from tasneem. Like when does, imagine this, when does your wife, when was the last time your wife or your husband made you a drink, it's perfectly made, and then added a shot on top of that? What do you feel when your wife or your husband gives you this drink? You love me. What have I done? Or what do you want? What do you want? What is it going to be? Right? It's like, the, like, not only did you make the drink perfect, but you added the extra shot. You know, for us, it could be like that. You know, you have a nice cup of tea, but then you add the nana, the, the mint, right? It gives it that kick, right? Or you add that, uh, we have a lot of herbs that you add into the tea, yeah? So the extra shot that gives it the extra kick. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and on top of that beautiful wine, there is a shot, a mixture of tasneem. Tasneem. And tasneem refers to one of the springs of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't even describe what it is much. Like there's some descriptions here and there, but it's just a spring of Jannah where that shot comes explicitly from there. But that same spring in Jannah, it may, some people might be getting shots here and there from it, but others will be drinking straight from it. Who are they? The muqarrabun. Those who are drawn near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying here? You are trying to cut little corners here and there and there when you should be competing, not just to get the shot in your drink from Jannah, but to be able to drink directly from the spring of Tasneem. That's what you should be competing for. To not just make it to Jannah, to not just get the shot in Jannah, but to get to be from the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are able to drink explicitly and directly from these springs. And you notice, subhanAllah, that and if you notice the subtlety in terms of the descriptions of Jannah, especially in the next surah, in Shiqaq and others, they will describe Jannah. And it's, it's just the perfect amount of description. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps saying, don't even try to use your imagination. You're never going to be able to imagine. But it's just enough to show you what is waiting for you and to encourage you to focus on what is truly important. That these things don't become coping mechanisms and dreams and aspirations that are fake, that are asatir al fables and ancient uh, depictions of people that were trying to control the uncontrollable. They can't control their lives, the living lives of suffering. So they have to invent and imagine this hereafter that is full of utopian justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, it's not that. It's not, this is real. It's coming directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will know it to be real and you will see it with your own eyes and you will get to see Allah with your own eyes, but not on your terms, on his terms. Now, when you want it, when Allah decides it, and that's part of what it means to submit. I submit. I know that there's a time and a place and limits within this time and place. And there's going to be a time and place when those limits are lifted. And when Allah shows and manifests himself to me. And I get to see the one that I've been worshipping all of these years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who make it to Jannah, Ya Rabbi Ameen. May Allah forgive us from, for our shortcomings, Ya Rabbi Ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be from those who compete with one another in the best of ways and bring the best out of each other through that competition, Ya Rabbi Ameen. Jazakumullah khairan, subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, nashar wa la ilaha ilan. Nastaghfiruka natubu alaykum, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.